Hello and welcome to a new bonus podcast from Never A Truer Word, Richard Merritt on the stand. Now this was a guy who was in court accused of killing his own mother and the reason I'm doing this video is not to work out whether the guy's telling the truth or, or whether he's um, being honest. I want to talk about clusters of indications. I must have about 40 markers of whether someone is telling the truth or whether someone is, is deceiving us and I always stress that one or two of these markers can be misspeaks or, or just the way someone talks. So it's never enough just to spot one or two little signs of deception or signs of truth to come to any conclusion. What we're looking for are repeated um, deception indicators or repeated truthful indicators um, or clusters of them all going together. We have to pay attention to a lot more than just one or two, potentially just little slip ups here to work out whether someone is telling the truth or not. And, and Richard, he, well, roll with it we'll see where he goes with it but yeah as i said richard was um, accused of killing his mother he's an attorney um and he took to the stand in his own defense so let's have a look at what he has to say and um and analyze it as we go a very loud knock at the front door all right first up i heard a very loud knock at the front door so he's telling us how he experienced something and i find that that's a marker number one when someone doesn't just tell us what happened, but tells us how they experienced it as well, almost like a bit of fiction, almost like stage directions in a film play or a screenplay or something like that. I, I wonder why they're going to all the trouble to tell us how they experienced it, as well as just telling us what they experienced, they have to say how they experienced it as well. So instead of just saying there was a loud knock at the front door, he says, I heard a loud knock at the front door. So that marker number one from this guy, but... One marker is never enough. We weren't expecting any visitors. So I went to the front door. Logic here. We weren't expecting any visitors, so I went to the front door. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? If you were expecting visitors, would you not have gone to the front door? So what I think is potentially going on here, again, this is just marker number two, but um, this is not real experience. He's not drawing on a real experience that happened to him. Hence, he just isn't able to verbalize fluidly and believably what happened. Hence why he says, we weren't expecting visitors, so I went to the front door. Also, he seems to be in a bit of and so storytelling, which is when someone is telling you events, instead of just saying what happened, he says, and this happened, so that happened and event happened, so thing happened. Um, and that is another marker that some, maybe not all is as it's being said here. So he did, wasn't expecting visitors, so he went to the front door and... And I opened it. And I opened it. So uh, again, I feel like we're in a, a screenplay here. So I went to the front door and I opened it. And there were two individuals there, two men, and they both were pointing pistols at me. I'm interested in his use of individuals there. And then when he corrects it to two men. Now, he's an attorney, so maybe he's got a slightly formal way of speaking or describing people. But I'm interested in why there are two individuals and not just two men pointing pistols at me. And they told me to let them in. And they told me to let them in. So how did that how did that happen? Again, this is why I think he doesn't have the words. He, this didn't happen. This is not a real experience for him. So he doesn't have the words to verbalize it fully. I mean, what are we on now? Marker six or seven, that things are, are not quite as they seem there. They told me to let them in. What, both at the same time? Was it like one, two, three, let us in? No, I don't believe that happened. It would be one of them said, let me in, let, let, let us in. So what did you do? I let him in. He's asked, so what did you do? And he answers, I let them in. That would be a perfect, straightforward, really simple, really short answer to the question. What did you do? I let them in. But so often in deception, people are so eager to tell a prepared story or get across what it is that they want to say that when they're asked the question, they will give more than just the answer to the question. They will add things in that they weren't asked for as well. And that's the case here. He's asked, so what did you do? He said, I let them in, and then he continues with more. I had never seen these guys before, and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. Okay, so we've got and, so I had never seen these guys before, and they were pointing pistols at me, so I let them in. Um, 
it does again logically it doesn't stack up does it would he have closed the door if he'd seen them before no that doesn't that doesn't add up i think he wants to get across that he'd never seen these guys before that they were complete strangers to him so he adds it in even though it doesn't make any sense in the context of what they were saying they were pointing pistols at me so i let them in i let them in they shut the door Okay, that's the third time he said, I let them in now. Now, normally when someone is truthfully telling something they've experienced, they'll just tell you about event one, event two, event three, event four, event five. Here, he's kind of gone event one, event two, event three, event four, event three again, I let them in. He says, I, so he let them in twice in his telling of the story. Um, and so when people jump around in timelines like that, again, it's, a, it's an indicator, a marker that there is something up with the storytelling. And they, again, they shut the door together, both hands on the handle and, you know, pushed it shut. Um, again, not just one of them shut the door. It's an action that only takes one person, but they together, they shut the door again. I'm coming to this thinking this is not something that really happened to him. He hasn't experienced this, so he doesn't have the words to verbalize it fluidly. Uh, about this time, my mother came to the foyer. Just about this time, my mother came to the foyer. This is such a story that he's telling. You know, obviously a very pivotal moment in his life, if we believe what he said. But he only thinks it was about this time his mother came to the foyer couple of things are happening could be happening here this is again it's that thing that he's not really experienced this so his words don't join up they don't flow they don't make a lot of logical sense potentially although i don't think that's the case here um there's a jump in time that something else happened when the men came in and they closed the door something else happened and later his mum came into to where they were and that's why it's about this time because actually he's covering up something else that happened but i don't think that's the case here where i was standing with these two individuals Again, we have this screenplay type thing of, you know, mum came in to where I was standing with these two individuals. Uh, nothing about any surprise. Um, you know, mum comes into the foyer and you're standing there with two guys pointing guns at you. There's nothing about mum's reaction whatsoever. And they said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. They said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. Once again, were the guys talking in harmony? Were they both saying the same thing at the same time? They said, head to the basement and don't say an effing word. So did you go to the basement? The taller of the individuals, he was older, probably in his 50s, about six feet, athletically built. He's asked, so did you go to the basement? And instead of saying, yes, we went to the basement or no, we didn't go straight to the basement. He gives a description of these people. Once again, I think the reason for this is that he's got a pre-planned story in his head. He's got all these things he wants to get across, all these markers in a story that he has made up that he wants to hit. And then that includes description of the individual because he thinks if he describes this, then it will make it more real. If he describes the people involved in this, it will make it more real when the story has been told. But he's, he's not directly answered the question. And when someone doesn't directly answer the question, deception is is really possible with what's coming walk past me put the gun at my mother's lower back screenplay it again this guy walked past me put the gun on my mother's lower back the fact that the guy walked past him is really not the most important thing in this the fact that someone put a gun on your mother's back would be shocking but no not for him the most important thing the first thing he wants to tell us about what happened is the guy walked past me what i will say actually though is that Everything in Richard's story so far has been told in past tense, which is uh, an indicator of truthfulness. When someone is recalling past events, if they say talk about them in past tense, that's what we expect to hear. When someone's telling a story and they start jumping between past and present tense, that's a bit of a giveaway that something or all, the entire story um, is, is being made up as fictitious. But Richard here is always in past tense so far. And she started to head towards the stairway to the basement okay she started to head towards the stairway of the basement again this is like a screenplay where there are stage directions you started to walk to the basement not just she walked to the basement or she headed to the basement but she started to walk to the basement and those little things that 
just a bit distant from someone telling you a story that they viscerally experienced at the time. In fact, they said head of the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement in case the house before. The fact they'd said head to the basement led me to think they knew we had a basement and had cased the house before. He's jumped backwards in time here. Surely that he thought that when they said head to the basement, he didn't think that after his mother had headed to the basement. So I think he, again, there's something in his story here that he's telling slightly out of whack, slightly out of time, because it, these things are important for him to say in his pre-prepared story. The younger of the men, he's probably about five eight, five nine. Shoulder length brown hair, pudgy. Did you see what I mean about screenplay? You know, this is like a description, isn't it? When you get a screenplay and you read um, the script and it's, uh, you know, there's a description of the person or or in a book when you're reading a, a thriller story and there's a description of the people. This is exactly what this reminds me of. He put his gun on my back and we followed them. Again, more of these um, screenplay stage directions. My mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. Now, this is very different. This feels a little bit, you, well, you can hear the hesitancy there. Um, that um, uh, that sort of thing, when someone is telling a traumatic story, uh, they will do, they'll, you know, the, the, the what happened will flash, well, you'd say flash in front of your eyes, but you're remembering it inside your brain. And if it's traumatic, you're going to have some hesitancy often in telling that story. And that's a very interesting jump. Um, and um, again, you know, it's not my mother. I could hear my mother crying as my mother was crying. So we've lost this distance here. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. This is much more believable. This is much more experiential to me than anything we've heard before. So I think in, in whatever happened and whatever the truth is, I think this did happen and he's describing it realistically. Just this section here, my mother was crying. She was making sounds like she might be wanting to scream or shout. And as they made the turn on the landing and took those first few steps by this point. Screenplay again, he's really intricately describing the choreography of what happened um and and really uh, again he's not going hesitant like he was when he was talking about um his mother making uh, the noises i and the guy behind me who had the gun on my back made it to the landing he told her to shut the f up and pushed her down the stairs okay now we've got people acting on their own the two men that he's describing are suddenly acting separately and he told her to shut the f up and pushed her down the stairs um, it's a little bit more believable than some of the things that I've heard f before from Richard. So again, I'm wondering if this in some way did happen. Often when someone's making a story up or lying about something, they'll use words that are not needed to kind of turn the emotion and what they're saying up to 11. That people who are lying sometimes feel they need to use words like complete or absolute or total um, to to make people think that they really mean it. If I use all these words to show how much I felt it, then people will believe what I'm saying. Truthful people tend to just tell the story very simply in as few words as possible. And that feels like what's here a little bit. This monster took this dumbbell and proceeded to bludgeon my mother right in front of me. Okay, now this is the first bit of emotion I've really seen here or when he calls the person a monster. Um, but again, it's not total monster or complete monster or violent monster. It's just this monster. It's quite direct. Took this dumbbell. Now, um, there is an edit there. So potentially how the dumbbell is chosen is, is spoken about. But it's almost as if he's talking about a specific dun dumbbell. Um, and he's really clear that this happened right in front of him. And she was, she stopped moving at this point. Okay. She was, uh, he goes, he was, he was going to say something, but he, he pulls out and starts stating it again in a different way. She stopped moving at this point. Again, um, when I was talking about the men coming into the house with the pistols and they closed the door and they said, shut the F up and so on. 
um, I was saying, I don't think he has the real words to um, to bring this to life because he hasn't experienced it. Whereas here, I really do think he has experienced this because he seems to be much more fluid. It seems to make a lot more sense when he's telling some parts of the story now. He then told the man who had his pistol in my back to bring me down to the bottom of the stairs. Screenplay again. They shoved me over to the tile where the dumbbell rested. Now, that one I was interested in. It doesn't seem to belong in the story, you know, exactly where he was, other than is it important to him to say that he was near the dumbbell at some point and it wasn't him who who made himself go near the dumbbell. It was they shoved me over to the tile. And see, it's they now. Again, it's not him. And then the older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife. Okay. The older guy took off up the stairs. He came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife. There's there's a lot missing here because the guy went up the stairs and for a few minutes, in Richard's words here, he was alone in the basement with one, uh, one of the men and his prone, stricken mother. But he doesn't mention any of that whatsoever. He doesn't say... Uh, anything about that whatsoever. In fact, he's almost telling this story from the older guy's point of view. The older guy took off up the stairs and then he came back a few minutes later with the kitchen knife, kind of like this dumbbell. That, um, I think most people have lots of knives in their kitchen, but it was the kitchen knife. Now, it could be the kitchen knife because of what happens with it and it's become very sensitive to him, but I'm interested in the kitchen knife. A note he calls it a knife. We'll see why that's important later and proceeded to stab my mother repeatedly in front of me. Again, quite straightforward. Um, very fluid description of what happened. Uh, and again, is right in front of him. So twice now he said these acts happened in front of him. I, I cannot believe what I was seeing. I didn't understand. I, I cannot believe what I was seeing. Um, I didn't understand. Um, I cannot, I can't, that's certainly present tense. It's not, I could not believe what I was seeing. Um, but there's no real emotion here. He's telling us what he thought. So he couldn't believe what he was seeing and he didn't understand. But considering what he's described, there's no emotion coming through whatsoever, whether that is my God about my mom, about his mom, or whether that's about the fear. Um, that was inside him. If they can do that to his mom, what are they going to do to him? But there's none of that in this story. And sometimes what's missing is as important as what is there. And so far, no emotion from him whatsoever. What would be the purpose? Because she wasn't moving. Why is any of this happening? So we're in logic again, rather than emotion. What would be the purpose? Um, and why is any of this happening? So this is, that's present tense. It was a complete and utter nightmare. What did I say about people turning the volume up to 11 on what's happening? Complete and utter nightmare. Not just it was a nightmare, but it was a complete and utter nightmare. He wants to get across to us how much of a nightmare it was. So what did you do when this happened? There's nothing I could do. I had a, a pistol on my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were. Okay, what did you do? And he says, there's nothing I could do. I had a pistol in my back. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had no clue who these people were. Now, he's asked, what did you do? And if he just said, there's nothing I could, I did nothing, there's nothing I could do, that would be answering the question directly. But he has to add in more that he hasn't been asked for, that he couldn't believe this was happening. Again, it's about what he was thinking, what his logical thoughts were, not his emotions in any way. And I had no clue who these people were. I think this is about the third time he said he did not know who these people were. It's really important for him to get across to us that he did not know who these people were. Why they were doing this to us. So he stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. He stabbed her with such force that the handle broke off the knife. If you're a body language fan, go and find this testimony on YouTube and watch his body language as he said that. It's it's incredibly, incredibly interesting when he says this. I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. 
I didn't realize at the time the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. Not I found out later that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face, but I didn't realize at the time that the knife was still stuck in my poor mother's face. Interesting. He put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. He then turned and looked at me and he pulled out his cell phone. Now, he said he didn't realize that the knife had broken, but he says he put the handle down on the tile from the dumb, across from the dumbbell. Not he put the knife down on the tile across from the dumbbell, but he put the handle down on the tile across from the dumbbell. Interesting choice of words. Again, it doesn't mean he's lying here, but in his experience, his experience as he remembers it would be the knife was put down there. So, But he says handle, even though he didn't realize it was only the handle at that time. And then the stage play comes back, the screenplay comes back. He turned and looked at me and pulled out his cell phone. And he proceeded to show me a picture of my ex-wife dropping off at her school, a picture of being dropped off or picked up at a picture of them all getting out of her van at their rental home in Marietta, and a picture of her either coming or going from her clinic and buyings. Very detailed about the pictures he was showing, isn't he? Doesn't just lump that all into one and say, then show me pictures that said he had been watching my ex-wife and my children very, very closely or pictures of my ex-wife and children coming and going in their daily life or anything like that. He's got all the details of the pictures down to a T. And he said, and I'll never forget this as long as I live, if you say a single word, they're next. One person said it, which is um, better than they said it. Um, but again, um, it feels once again like a screenplay with all the actions in between all the events. I had no doubt who they were or what next meant. And then they left. <laughs> After all that detail, they just left. No emotion from him and no... After everything in that story, they left. And then, did you call police? No, I did not call the police. Did you call the police, he's asked, and he says, no, I did not call the police. And that is an indicator of a factual, truthful answer. It directly answers the question, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Um, it's very short. There's nothing added in there. Now, I guess the fact he didn't call the police is a matter of records, which means it's not really going to be worth lying about it in court. But that, just to prove to you what a truthful answer looks like, did you call the police? No, I did not call the police. Looks like a truthful answer. Because I just witnessed an unimaginable act of violence. Two unimaginable acts of violence. And then a man coldly looked at me after he's standing over the body of my dear mother that he skewered and bludgeoned. Okay, he's asked, why not? Why did he not call the police? And instead of saying I was petrified or the guy had told me not to and after seeing what he could do, Mm, I wasn't going to take that chance. Instead of any of those things, he talks about what he's experienced again. So he's asked, why didn't you phone the police? And it's not at the start of his answer. I was petrified. I was told not to. Um, I wasn't thinking straight. I'd just seen the most horrific thing of my life. No, he just talks about what he's experienced again. And shows me pictures of my family. So no, I did not call the police. So there's enough markers in there. Did you count them? I didn't count them, but there's a lot of markers in there that Richard Merritt is not telling a story that is believable in any way, not something that he experienced apart from certain aspects of it, the violent aspects of it that happened to his mother. I noticed some truth when he's talking about that part of the story and everything else, so many markers that this guy is lying and lying badly. And I think the jury agreed with me, as you can see. Uh, he was found guilty um, of beating his own mother to death. I want to finish with one more witness from this trial. And this is a guy who, you, well, let's look. Is he showing markers of truth or is he showing markers of deception? Up to you to decide. What is that? 
That is the bottom of the stairs where Shirley was. Go any closer than this to Shirley's body? I did. I called her name. She didn't respond. I... You can see he's been asked questions and he's answering only what he's been asked. He's not adding anything extra in. He's not doing and then storytelling. He's actually going event one, event two, event three, event four. He's not putting in any words to make us believe that he's being truthful. Therefore, I think this is entirely truthful testimony. Here's some more. I went down, checked for a pulse. There was none. And at that point, I knew it was a crime scene and I backed out. Honestly, no. I wasn't paying any attention to anything else. Now, he says, honestly, no. Honestly is one of those things when someone says it, I ask a question. Have they been lying before? And now they're telling you, oh, I'm being honest now. Or more likely, are they being deceptive in some way and telling you honestly so that you really believe what it is they have to say? But again, it can just be a figure of speech that people use. And seeing as we've seen no other markers of deception in, in this guy, it's all been very straightforward, lean in his words. Then I, I, that's one marker. I, I don't see any more, but you know, let's go to the end of the video. Did you move her at all? No. Um, and what did you do at that point? I, I backed out of there and I called 911. You can see, I believe this guy has experienced that and he's talking to us about his experience, hence why he has the words to tell us about that and make it flow when he talks about it. So that is what truthful testimony looks like. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you want to connect on social media, connect.neveratruerword is a really good place to do that. You can get me on all the social medias there. If you've got any words, maybe some more testimony in courts that you'd like me to look at you can get in touch with me there as well connect.neveratruerword.com and if you like this podcast you may well like the words of west court podcast which looks at the murder of sophie toscan de plantier in ireland in the 1990s or oj simpson in his words which looks at the infamous oj simpson case and his police interview you can find both of those at neveratruerword.com